Hi and welcome to uh, part 3 of sharding. And so uh, in the previous episodes we took a look at how to set up and configure a sharder and install the tables. In this particular episode we're going to go through and talk about adding new shards to the sharded database. So as I mentioned uh, in the first part of the series we basically installed two shards and a shard director and these were running inside of virtual machines. They were running with 12.2.01 of the database. And we saw how simple it was to create the sharded database, deploy tables to it and have the environment set up by the sharded software as well. So very simple if you haven't seen it, I suggest you go back and take a look at that demonstration um, and uh, look, follow that through and then come back to part three. In this particular episode, what we're going to do is we're going to add a new shard to the sharded database. Very simple process. All that we need to do is to go through inside of the control panel, add a new shard. Um, and it will go through as previously install the database on um, the new shard and then begin the process of rebalancing the rows from shard 1 and shard 2 to shard 3 and it will do this using um, units of data called chunks and we're going to discuss that in just a second um, and the whole point about this is it enables your business to better respond to changes in the workload. So at the end of the financial year, you may choose to add additional nodes to uh, enable you to uh, close your books. During the Christmas period, you may choose to add additional servers to um, manage the additional workload coming from the retail environment. Okay, so one of the core concepts around sharding and the storage of data inside of a sharded database is that of chunks. So if I was creating a table, a series of tables on a non-sharded database, what I would do is I would create the table and give, um, as part of its storage definition, a table space for that given table. So I would always know that this table and any other tables I, uh, I feel inclined would be placed inside of that table space. And that's all good. In a sharded database, you have roughly the same concept, other than the fact that we have to build table spaces clearly across many shards and independent databases. To help address that requirement, we have the concept of a table space set. What a table, spe set, table space set enables us to do is to define um, the storage for a given table or series of tables and have that automatically be placed across all of the shards. Inside of the table space set, what will happen underneath the covers is a number of table spaces, um, which has a close correlation with chunks, will be created to store the given data. So on this particular example, we've created a table space set, all just table space set, and we've specified a chunk of six, which basically means that for each shard, um, three chunks will be created um, and these will map to three table spaces on that given database. And inside of each of those chunks, we will place the underlying tables and uh, effectively rows that are held inside of those tables. Now, the important point about this is, and I mentioned it in um, the earlier parts of this series, was that Oracle guarantees that if you specify a relationship between two tables um, that the data held inside of those tables will be guaranteed to be placed on a single shard around their shard key. So in this example if we have customers and, a cust and we're sharding by a customer ID um, and there is a relationship between customers and the orders table, we will guarantee that the orders for a given customer will be placed in the same chunk on the same shard. And why is that important? Well, as we add or remove shards from our sharded database, that chunk containing both the customers and the orders information will be used and will be moved as a single unit 
which means that um, when we actually query or update the data we only have to go to one shard to update the information around that shard key. And so what we'll do in the uh, next 10 minutes we'll show, so is show you how you can go through and add a shard um, to our sharded database and what the implications will be for the underlying um, chunks inside of the data set as they're moved around the various shards. As we add the new shard, the chunks will actually move alongside it. And if at some stage in the future we choose to drop that shard, I'll also show how easy it is to remove those chunks from the sharded database onto a new server. Okay, let's take a look at that now. Okay, so what we've got here is the environment that we set up earlier on in the previous episode. So um, we have our three um, virtual machines, the director and the two shards. And if we come into the GDS CTL tool uh, and type config, what we can see here is a description of the sharded configuration. So we actually have our sharded director, the database, and uh, the two shards that we've created. And that's all well and good. Um, the other thing that's of interest to us is to take a look and see how these chunks are actually spread across our sharded database. And what we can see here is for the table set that we actually created, we have 120 chunks. And those 120 chunks, if we go across to one of these shards and run a, a script, what can, we can see is that on each one of the shards, um, we've created a uh, effectively um, 60 table spaces to hold that table space set within. So that's our level of granularity. We have 120 uh, effectively partitions of our data set that is spread across our sharded databases. Now to add the new cluster all we need to do is exactly the same thing that we did in um, episodes 1 and 2 where we created um, the sharded database, we specify create shard, we give it the template that we're actually looking to use um, and use the credentials that we created previously uh, and hit deploy and as soon as we type deploy um, the process will begin of um, figuring out what needs to be done to add the shard to the sharded cluster and that process will kick off the creation of a database on this new shard and this new shard that we've created is identical to the previous shards it's just a clone from the shard director but what we can see in the background is if we keep monitoring the processes is that the agent that's running on this shard is going through and creating a database for us and we can start to see the um, core processes that are actually being spawned inside of this environment to, to create this database and that makes it easy for us to uh, add um, new databases to our sharded database. Now, um, if we um, now go back to the uh, um, main uh, shard director, what we can see if we look online is that we have our three shards. And more importantly, if we look below, I've started a little utility to just map the actual location of the shards inside of our environment. Now, I've sped this up just a little bit. What we can see is that the shards have been moved in this particular instance um, off um, shard one and now beginning to move them off shard two onto our newly created shard, which has got the name shard two one. But over time, we can see this process going on in the background and this is happening online. We could be running a transaction workload. There's nothing that we actually need to do other than let this run in the background. And over time, the actual chunks will be moved to the new shard. And because the chunks have been moved to the new uh, shard, we, uh, the underlying rows are also being moved at the same time. So this is very simple for us. Um, and there's nothing that we really need to do. Now, if we come back online and take a look at what's happening on that shard in terms of the chunks themselves, we can see that um, the chunks have been moved off shard one and shard two onto uh, shard two one. So now we actually have two sets of new shard chunks that have been placed from the previous shards. If we go into uh, shard three, um, it, 
and log on as the user which was created for us in the underlying tables and do a count on the uh, customers um, table. Uh, what we can see here is the uh, rows have been moved from uh, the uh, previous shard 1 and shard 2 onto shard 3. So now we have a balanced distribution of the rows that we'd previously created in uh, our, our earlier episodes. And this is great, but now supposing uh, we make a decision that we want to drop this newly created shard, how do we go about doing that? Well the first thing that we have to do is to move all of those chunks. And how do we move those chunks? It's simply a case of uh, move chunk, specify the location we want to move all of the chunks off so off the newly created shard to any of the existing shards environment. We issue this command, the shard director goes away and thinks about how to implement this process and in the background it's figuring out the locations and the space it has available to us and as soon as it's figured out how to actually go through and do that process it will then go back and in the background kick off the process of moving that data. Now this um, we can still access uh, the information on shard 3, we can still log on to that particular shard, we can still access it um, it's just a case of identifying where this information is going to be moved to. Now I mentioned earlier on that we can still perform transactions against this sharded database while we're adding or removing shards. Let's give you a quick demonstration of this. So I've started off a transaction workload running against our sharded database and we're actually adding new customers um, during this period in time. So we're inserting new uh, customers and as we're doing that what we can see here instead of the number of customers increasing on our old shard 3 it's actually decreasing and if we log on to shard 1 or shard 2 and take a look at the numbers of rows that are actually um, appearing what we can see here is uh, the number of rows on shard 1 is increasing so all of, so in the background we have new chunks being removed back to shard uh, 1 and 2 and as a consequence new rows being uh, added to those databases. And if we look at the chart here we can see that um, the number of uh, chunks available on our previous uh, shard, shard 2.1, which is in pink, is decreasing. So it increased and now it's uh, decreasing and those chunks have been repositioned around our given environment. So again going back to shard 1 and shard 2 they're increasing whereas the number of rows on shard 3 is decreasing. And the beauty of this solution is that um, we can dynamically flex the actual shape and size of our cluster given um, a requirement for the workload. And once we've actually gone through and dropped all of those chunks inside of our environment, um, we can then simply drop the shard itself. So again, taking a look at the actual chunks and um, where we currently are, we can see that we've got a distribution of those chunks and this will go on over a period of time. And that's all there is to it. Once the actual chunks have um, been uh, finished, um, the movement uh, to shard 1 and shard 2, we can simply go through and drop that shard. And this makes it very simple uh, inside of our environment. Now, um, that's pretty much all I had to show you for this particular episode. Um, we may come back and do a final episode uh, where we talk about some of the utilities potentially going through and add, um, using a data card to create replicas of the underlying shards as well. Um, there will be an additional episode purely on running JSON. So until then, um, thanks very much. <laughs>